All right, so we're going to start in Philippians tonight. Are you excited? May I, may I ask a question? Yeah. What translation do you want to use? Oh, well, that's a great question. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to be reading um, when we do it out of the NRSV for the most part. Here's what I want you guys to do as we go through this. When you read um, scripture, it, it, it's, um, it's a really great idea to read passages over and over again, obviously, but to read from different translations. So here's, here's what I'd like you guys to be doing. I want you guys to try to, this will probably be about seven or eight weeks to go through Philippians. Um, what I'd like you to do is at least once a week, and really it's not a long book. I mean, it, it should you should be able to read through it every day. But at least once a week, I'd like you to read through the entire book in one sitting. Not a little bit here, a little bit there. Just in one sitting, sit down, read through the entire book. But I want you to do it in a different translation each time. I don't care if you use King James Version, The Message, um, NASB. But each time, I'd like you to use a different translation. And, and let me explain to you why. This is going to help you... Um, I told you guys before, part of the thing that I do when we teach this is I don't want to just teach you about the book of Philippians. I, I want so that if I die tomorrow, you guys can handle reading the rest of the scripture on your own and learn how to study it. And one of the best ways is to read different translations. So let me tell you guys some things just right off, top, right, right off kind of the top on the layout. There's no giant conspiracy that, um, you know, there's only one translation and the rest are wrong. Um, there was no canonized book when Jesus was around. I love the King James Version for its poetic value, but I don't recommend it to a lot of people to read because it's not in English. It's an Elizabethan. It's a Shakespearean language. So it, it's hard to read, but I love the poetic value. And when I do the Lord's Prayer or the, the, the Golden Rule, for me, they only work in King James, right? Our Father who art in heaven. It's just something that I like. But um, Jesus didn't read the King James Version, okay? Um, there are a lot of good translations out there. If you would like to learn more about which translations are, are where on the spectrum, we can, um, I can help you with that as well. But it's not that one translation is, is better than the other, other than each translation is trying to get a point across from a certain perspective. We take for granted especially if you're a monolinguist. So if you only speak one language, um, it, it's easy to take for granted that the, the entirety of the words that you know are not the entirety of the words in the world. Your, your vocabulary is limited, all of ours are. And in translations in different languages, vocabularies don't go across the board for the most part. In fact, Greek is a great example because where we use the word the, there are um, 1, 2, 3, 4, 12, 24 different versions of the word the in the Greek. And every one of those distinctions, every one of those versions is very distinct. It has a particular purpose. Now, the problem is, as a translator, when I go to translate the word, I don't have an English word to translate it. I might have this word here and this word here, but the real word somewhere here in the middle and so one translator might choose this, one might choose another. So what I want you guys to be doing is I want you to read it in a couple of translations. If you got a parallel Bible, that's a great way to do it. And make some notes. So I got homework for you. Ah, see what I've done? I want you to make notes about words that were different, even maybe that seem significantly different, so that we can talk about why is this one translated this way and this one this way. As we read, and I'm reading through, if your translation has something different than I read or significantly different, feel free to say, hey, pastor, this, um, this translate, your, yours is different than mine. Let's talk about it, because that's what I want us to be doing, okay? So great question, um, Doug. That's going to kind of lead us into where we're at. So my answer to you is whatever you want to use. But what are you using? I'll be using the NRSV for the most part. NRSV, okay. I just, it's a nice, it's a nice balanced book for me. Any not to sound dumb, Go ahead. Bro, not to sound dumb, but what is the NRSV? Uh, it's the new revised, um, oh, see, I'm, new revised standard version. 
It's actually like I think an 89 model uh, a Bible. I think it was the last time it really was. I, I like it because for me personally, I like the NASB. The NASB is one of the most literal word for word translations, but it reads really wooden. And I used to read it in Bible studies and it loses a lot of meaning because it's so wooden. The NRSV for me is a nice blend. It, it's a pretty okay. good literal translation, but it's it's readable. Lurie, she likes the NASB. So I always ask Lurie, okay, what does the NASB read? Um, I know uh, Janet and Lewis always got the KJV, right? Yeah. I know where to go. I know who all my people read, where a lot of my people read, so I know where to go. Go ahead, Doug. Can I just follow along with this translation for tonight? Yeah, whatever you like. It doesn't matter. Okay, thank I'm you. I'm going to put it on the screen anyway as I read. Oh, oh, nice. Never mind. But I do want you guys to be pulling those up. We're going to ask questions. We're going to we're going to read scripture and dig through it together. This is my favorite thing to do. Read the Bible and then go, what's it say? With that being said, I also want to say that as much as I love digging into the Bible, we also want to make sure that we don't pick it to death. There's a difference between um, digging into the Bible and dissecting the Bible. When you dissect something, you have to kill it. We're not here to kill the Bible. Right? <laughs> We're here to just dig into it and then see what's what's going on and what it's saying. So we will kind of keep it there and we'll try to just make this fun and, and see what it says. Okay, so here's what we're gonna start with. Something I love to start with every book. There's an amazing group out there that already does a great deal of work. These people managed to put in five, 10 minute videos, um, just some of the most brilliant work. In fact, uh, one of my favorite theologians, Scott Daniels, his, um, his, his last, two decades of work has been in um, the, the, the contemporary model of the church in exile. And so he talks about the Babylonian exile. He's written numerous books about it. Well, these people did a five minute video on exile. And when they first came out, I love it. He posted on his Facebook and he says, um, the Bible project managed to do in a five minute video what has taken me 23 years and four books to do. <laughs> so, so we're going to watch a video real quick. It's just about a 10-minute video, and it's going to give us a brief overview of Philippians, and hopefully it kind of gives us a place to start, okay? All right, any questions before we go any further? Is it rude to be drinking something? Feel free to drink something. Grab your popcorn, folks. This is the time. All right, give me a second while I do some screen share and get this going. Um, screen share. You see that, right? Oh, hold on. I didn't share sound. You're going to want sound, aren't you? Yeah, Pastor, we want to hear it. Okay, okay, fine. Don't yell. Okay, can you hear that? What? Paul's letter to the Philippians. The church in Philippi was the first Jesus community Paul started in Eastern Europe, and that story is told in Acts chapter 16. Philippi was a Roman colony in ancient Macedonia. It was full of retired soldiers, and it was known for its patriotic nationalism. And so there, Paul faced resistance when he was announcing Jesus as the true king of the world. And after Paul moved on from there, those who became followers of Jesus continued to suffer resistance and even persecution, but they remained a vibrant community faithful to the way of Jesus. Paul sent this letter from one of his many imprisonments, and for a very practical reason. The Philippians had sent one of their members, Epaphroditus, to take a financial gift to Paul to support him in prison. And Paul sent back this letter with Epaphroditus to say thank you and to do a whole lot more. The design of this letter doesn't develop one single idea from beginning to end like many of Paul's other letters. Rather, Paul has arranged a series of short, reflective essays or vignettes, and they all revolve around the center of gravity in this letter, which is a poem in chapter 2. It artistically retells the story of the Messiah's incarnation, his life, death, and resurrection, and exaltation. And then in each of these vignettes, Paul will take up key words or ideas from that poem to show how living as a Christian means seeing your own story as a lived expression of Jesus' story. So Paul opens the letter with a prayer of gratefulness, and he thanks God for the Philippians' generosity, for their faithfulness, and he expresses his confidence that the life-transforming work that God has begun in them will continue into greater and more beautiful expressions of faithfulness and love. And Paul then focuses on their obvious concern at the moment, which is his status in prison. Being in a Roman prison was no 
picnic. But it paradoxically has turned out for good to advance the good news about Jesus. So all of the Roman guards, the administrators, they all know that Paul's in prison for announcing Jesus as the risen Lord. And his imprisonment, it's inspired confidence in other Christians to talk about Jesus more openly. And Paul's optimistic that he will be released from prison, but it's possible that he could be executed. And as he reflects on it, that actually wouldn't be so bad because for me, Paul says, life is the Messiah. And so dying would be a gain. For Paul, his life in the present and in the future, it's defined by the life and love of Jesus for him. And so if he's executed, that means he'll be present with Jesus, which would be great for him. And if he's released, well, that would mean he could keep working to start more Jesus communities, which would be better for other people. And so that's what he hopes for. And notice how his train of thought works here. Dying for Jesus is not the true sacrifice for Paul. Rather, it's staying alive to serve others. And so that's Paul's way of participating in the story of Jesus, to suffer in order to love others more than himself. Paul then turns to the Philippians and he urges them to participate in Jesus' example by taking up this same mindset. He says, your life as citizens should be consistent with the good news about the Messiah. So these Christians in Philippi, they were living in a hotbed of Roman patriotism, but their way of life was to be shaped by another king, Jesus. And that might bring persecution, but they are not to be afraid because suffering for being associated with Jesus, it's a way of living out the story of Jesus himself. Which leads Paul into the great poem of chapter 2. It's rich with echoes of Old Testament texts, specifically the story of Adam and his rebellion in Genesis 1-3, through and the poems about the suffering servant in the book of Isaiah. This poem is worth committing to memory. It is a beautifully condensed version of the gospel story. So before becoming human, the Messiah pre-existed in a state of glory and equality with God. And unlike Adam, who tried to seize equality with God, the Messiah chose not to exploit his equal status for his self-advantage. Rather, he emptied himself of status. He became a human. He became a servant to all. And even more than that, he allowed himself to be humiliated. He was obedient to the Father by going to his death on a Roman execution rack. But through God's power and grace, the Messiah's shameful death has been reversed through the resurrection. And now God has highly exalted Jesus as the King of all, bestowing upon him the name that is above all names, so that all creation should recognize that Jesus the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now that last statement is astounding. Paul's quoting from Isaiah chapter 45. It's a passage where all creation comes to recognize the God of Israel as Lord. Paul's point here is very clear. In the crucified and risen Jesus, we discover that the one true God of Israel consists of God the Father and the Lord Jesus. And so for Paul, this poem, it expresses his convictions about who Jesus is, and it does more. It offers the example of Jesus as a way of life that his followers are to imitate. And so that's why Paul immediately goes on to tell two stories, first about Timothy, then about Epaphroditus, because they are both examples of people living out Jesus' story. So Timothy's like Jesus because he's constantly concerned for the well-being of other people more than his own. And Epaphroditus, who the Philippians sent with their gift, he ended up risking his life to serve Paul in prison. He got so sick he almost died trying to help Paul. But God had mercy on him and Paul by sparing him the loss of a friend. Paul's point here is that these are the kinds of people who are living, breathing examples of the story of Jesus, and they are worthy of imitation. Paul then turns to his own story as an example. So those Christians who had been demanding circumcision of non-Jewish Christians, remember his letter to the Galatians, these people are still stirring up trouble for Paul, and they keep reminding him of his own past. When he used to persecute Jesus' followers, when he tried to show his right standing before God by his zealous obedience to the laws of the Torah. But like Jesus, Paul has given up all of that status and privilege. He now regards all of it as filth. And the word he uses is actually much less polite. He's given it all up to become a servant, like Jesus, to participate in his suffering and sacrificial love. And he does all of it in the hope that Jesus' love will carry him through death and out the other side into resurrection. 
So Paul says that for followers of Jesus, their true citizenship is in heaven, which for Paul does not mean that we should all hope to get away from earth and go to heaven one day. Rather, heaven is the transcendent place where Jesus reigns as king. And he says we're eagerly awaiting our royal savior to come from there and return here to bring his kingdom of healing justice and transforming love to bring about a new creation. Paul then challenges the Philippians to keep living out the Jesus story. He first addresses two prominent women leaders in the church who worked alongside Paul, and they're in some kind of conflict. And so Paul pleads with them to follow Jesus' example of humility, to reconcile and become unified. Paul then urges the Philippians not to give in to fear, but despite their persecution, to vent all of their emotion and their needs to God, who will give them peace. And that peace, Paul says, it comes by focusing your thoughts on what is good and true and lovely. There's always something that you could complain about, but a follower of Jesus knows that all of life is a gift and can choose to see beauty and grace in any life circumstance. Which leads Paul to his conclusion. He again thanks the Philippians for their sacrificial gift, and he wants them to know that his imprisonments, that his times of poverty, that these are not true hardships for him. They've actually become his his greatest teachers, showing him that no matter his circumstances, he has learned the secret of contentment, its simple dependence on the one who strengthens him. Paul has come to see his own suffering as a participation in the story of Jesus. The letter to the Philippians gives us a unique window into Paul's own heart and mind. He saw his entire life as a reenactment of the story of Jesus. And you can sense in this letter his close connection to Jesus, his awareness that Jesus' love and presence is closer than his own skin. And that's what gave him hope and humility in his darkest hours. And so Paul shows us that knowing Jesus is always a deeply personal transforming encounter. And that's the the kind of Jesus that Paul invites others to follow. And that's what Paul's letter to the Philippians is all about. Okay. That's a good start, huh? I love their videos. I think they do a really good job of unpacking it. So, we're going to start the reading and we're going to just kind of ask some questions, start seeing what we find in there. And let me share here. Don't want that. I do want that. Okay. Can you guys see that? Okay. So we have the letter of Paul to the Philippians. So let's start reading. Uh, I'm going to read. We'll get through 11 here. I have confidence in us today. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because you hold me in your heart for all of you sharing God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. All right, so let's start at the beginning here. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ. Now this should be obvious. Who's, who's writing the letter? Paul. Paul. Yeah, so I, I had a question on that, right? Because he's supposed to be writing this from prison. And Marlene and I talked about this yesterday, but I don't believe Timothy was with him in prison. So how can Timothy help him write the letter? Prison's a little different there. Um, today, when you go to jail, you're just stuck in jail and you wait for visiting hours for people to come, and then they leave. And in the COVID world, you can ask Pastor Kathy, you don't even get to go to the jail to visit anybody on account of the COVID. 
in a Roman prison, it's a little bit different, especially depending on who you are. Paul's a Roman citizen. And so Paul has um, a lot of rights and a lot of respectability. And he is a respected person. And we're going to talk a little bit more. I know we've talked before in the past about the whole honor-shame system, but Paul is an honored person. As such, and he even mentions in Acts that when he does go to prison, he's allowed basically an entourage to care for him. So in jail, he has people who are able to come to him, care for him, including Timothy, and be with him and, you know, be a secretary, right, and things like that. Does that make sense? Yep. Yep. <laughs> Good question. Okay, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. What might be significant about Christ Jesus? Who are they servants of? Say that again. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Why is that significant? Why might that be significant? Because it's not Caesar. <laughs> it's actually a pretty big deal. Yeah, I'm not Caesar. And it's interesting because Paul's, Paul's in prison. And remember, they live in Rome and and we're going we're gonna to talk about this a lot. This is something that's really important for us to try to grasp. It's really difficult. We don't live in this world. The, the first century Rome was, was a society of honor shame. And, and it was basically you built your honor. You, you fought for honor, but you had to do it at the expense of another. So nobody does things. To act humility and humility in the first century Rome, was, it was just uncouth. Like what kind of an uncivilized person would let somebody else talk about them or dump on them or so you do not do that i know today that's kind of like yeah i like taking shots for my friends you know or standing up for others and i'm okay with getting beat up if it means you know taking the high road you don't talk like that in the first that is not this world and so it's really difficult for us to grasp how how much this is a part of that system and because of that, Paul's words are huge. Remember, Paul's already a respected person. He's a Roman citizen. He's a well-trained Jew. He was trained in some, you know, under some of the greatest people. He's trained under Gamaliel himself. So he's well-trained. He's educated. Um, theologians and historians believe he came from probably a, a fairly well-to-do family. He's, you know, he is, he's known. And yet Paul starts using words, and it's interesting, this word servants, how many of you have a word different than servants in any of your Bibles? I do. What do you I have, do. Marie? I just, I have bond servant. Bond servant? Okay. I have slaves. Who has slaves? I do. NLT. In the, all right. Slaves is probably a more accurate translation. The, the, the word um, doulos that it comes from means slave. It literally means a slave. So he's saying I'm a slave. Now, Today, we might use that as a figure of speech. Oh, I'm a slave to the grind or I'm a slave to this. But in first century Rome, to be a slave, um, while it was different than the slave we understood, to be a slave still meant that you were on the bottom of the totem pole when it came to honor shame. A slave had zero honor, zero credibility. And so when Paul calls himself a slave, he's challenging the entire socio-political system. He's, he's, um, he's ultimately rebelling against it by saying, I... I'm a slave. And then he contrasts this, I'm a slave to Christ Jesus. Now, what do we know about the term Christ Jesus? It's a title, not his last name. Okay, title, not his last name. Well, what does Christ mean? Messiah. Literally. It means the anointed one. The anointed one, yeah. Very good. The Very anointed good. One, yeah. And it's awesome because in the Greek, it can mean either the anointed one or Messiah. And Messiah, even in the Hebrew, means the anointed one of God. So Jesus, the anointed one of God. I am a slave. I'm nothing to the one who is the anointed one of God. He's contrasting these two exact, if you will, on, on any spectrum of, of, of what they understood, opposite ends of the world, right? And probably for us, too. I mean, we would see it that way. We are very different from God. He is much higher than we are. So Paul's language is important. He's a brilliant writer. So he says, Paul and Timothy, servants, slaves, dunamized to Christ Jesus, the anointed one, to Messiah. Okay, so that's who it's from. And then he writes, 
to all the saints. I used to struggle with this language. I was raised Catholic. And when we said saint, it meant like St. Christopher, St. Francis of Sissy. It meant somebody who the church declared to be a saint. They weren't just good people. They were like the best of the best. It was like if God was going to put a dream team together, he'd call out the saints. That's a, that was the mentality I had. And to be fair, if you, even if you weren't raised Catholic, that is kind of the mentality most Christians understand the word saint. Would, would you guys that sound like a fair assessment or? Yes. But what does Paul mean when he says to all the saints? Who is he talking to? Believers of Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's basically the short of it. He's talking about the believers in Christ. All believers in Christ are the holy ones, which is what the word means. It just means the, the, word, the Greek word for saints means holy ones. It's an, it's a, an adjective. Or, or an, yeah, an adjective. It just means the holy ones in Jesus Christ who are in Philippi. Okay. So the saints, all the believers, and this is important language. So whenever you see Paul talk about the saints, he's not talking about a specific group of Christians. He's talking about every single believer. And more than that, this language doesn't even come just from the Christian aspect. We have to remember, Paul's not a Christian. What is Paul? He's a Jew. He's a Jew. Jew. Right. To be fair, we, we are the ones who have this very separated view of a Jew and a Christian. It's Paul never said, Jew. I'm a Jew, and then one day said, ah, I'm changing religions and I'm becoming a Christian and shifting gears. That has never happened. In fact, Paul goes out of his way to say, I'm a Jew. I'm a very educated, highly legalistic Jew. And then gets to the point where he says, oh, but Christ is the Messiah, which means that to be a good Jew, I need to be following Christ. And so he continues on as a Jew following Christ and understanding the new covenant of Christ. Let's stop there for a second. Talk to me about that. Well, what might that mean? What pushback might we have there? What what pushback? Yeah. How does that does that make sense? I guess what I'm saying. Well, yeah. I don't, I don't really know when the word Christian came into play, because that means little Christ, right? They were first called Christians at Antioch, so we first see that in Acts. Okay. But for us, what I want us to do is this, and it's going to be kind of a tough exercise as well. I want us to try to not differentiate them the way we see it today. In today's world, if I tell somebody, so-and-so is a Jew, they're going to immediately say, well, they're a part of this religion. If I say so-and-so is a Christian, they're going to immediately say, oh, so-and-so is a part of this religion. And there's a huge gap between them. In fact, it, it, you might say that the gap between the Christian and Jew, the way the world sees it today, might be the same as the gap between the Christian and the Muslim. Right? We don't worship the same God. Sort of, kind of, well, maybe we're a little closer related to the Jew than we are the Muslim, but we're not Jews. Paul doesn't have that mentality. He, he doesn't. Now, to be fair, in the first century, even Jews are seeing that they're taking Judaism and they're going in a different direction with it. And so they call them people of the sect, right? They have the this followers sect. of the way. And so you'll hear that language. You'll hear him say this new sect or they, they're following this new way or this new person. But their, their concern is still this. Paul's a Jew. And he's using a Jewish title and Jewish things. Even Jesus walked around and was called a rabbi. It's a Jewish title that says he was trained in, in the Jewish schools. Right? So, so this thing for Paul isn't something he's trying to separate. What he's trying to explain, and, and we'll see in a lot of his letters, is he's trying to explain to the Jews is this isn't God saying I'm done with this religion and I'm moving over to this one. 
This is a fulfillment, a continuation. So really a more fair way to look at it is Christianity is the continuation of this religion following through. And, and, um, and while that, that's a little awkward for us today, that's where Paul's at. And we need to understand that. Paul's not throwing out one religion in favor of another religion. He is, he's completing this. He's saying, I've been enlightened and I've realized that this was always meant to go here. And so he's going to follow through with that. So, so one thing that, that would stick out, right, is obviously, you know, Jews are Jews and they're Jews. So now Paul is preaching and his, his main job was to preach to the Gentiles. And he's preaching to Jews, right? Jesus preached to Jews to tell them about this new way, right? And then the disciples preached this new way and they were Jews as well, right? And then Paul comes along and starts preaching to the Gentiles, right, Romans, right, telling them, no, you're going to be part of this too. And like you said before, the Jews were very separatist, right? Like, well, you're not in our group, so how can we be going after the same thing, which is Jesus, right? If the Jews are, I mean, if the Gentiles are going after Jesus or believing in him, then how can we be Jews and go after him, right? I, I, would, I would see that as a conflict just on... Like, well, we, how could we be going in the same place? We're not the same, right? Yeah. And the reason is, and this, this, you know, this might even um, help us to understand a little better, maybe, maybe not. Passages like when Jesus says he spoke everything in parables and then he quotes Isaiah because having eyes, so that having eyes they can never see, having ears they can never hear. These people were on the track. He quotes Isaiah and even Jeremiah mentions this. You're here. God's telling you this. He's saying to do this. But in your mind, it's meant to go there. And God wants you to go there. And so because they keep looking there, Jesus is like, I'm here. I've been telling you this from the beginning. This is where it's supposed to be. They're like, why are you bringing Gentiles in? This is a Jewish community. In fact, their very identity for them, salvation was being the people of God. That's, right. mm -hmm. That's all salvation was for them. It's about being the people of God and being specifically the people of God. And so if we're the people of God, everyone's people of God. Well, then what's the distinction? What does it matter? We can't be letting Gentiles in. And, and they didn't, right? Gentiles could believe. That's why in Acts, you see three distinct groups. You see Jews, Gentiles, and Gentile believers. A Gentile can believe in Yahweh and go through the whole Jewish thing, get circumcised, but he'll never be a Jew. He'll only be a Gentile believer. And then when they would go to the temple, they would be at the outer court. They couldn't even go into the inner courts. They had the Gentiles court. And Jesus is saying, I'm going to destroy the temple. We're not doing that. That's not what it's meant to be. It's about everyone being together. And I'm going to make this a blessing to all nations, like we promised Abraham in the first place. And so, yeah, Mark, you're exactly right. For them, it would be like, you're going in a whole other direction. And Paul's like, no, that's just it. He isn't. We were on the wrong track the whole time. How do you think something like that's going to go over with the whole society, right? <laughs> yeah, that's not going to end well. You try to turn society around, and how does the outside react? Well, the only thing in, that I saw was Nineveh, right? They were the only ones that kind of, as a city, maybe not a whole nation, but a city turned around right, to get a whole nation to turn around. That, yeah. right? And great irony, because Nineveh was the capital city of, um, of a very pagan nation that was very anti-Yahweh. And so the only people who decided to repent and serve him on faith was a bunch of non-Jews. So, yeah, that's a great example. Okay, let's come back to the passage a little bit. Those are really good. We're going to dig more into them as we go. But um, we're not going to get through 11 today, are we? <laughs> uh, you guys ask too many good questions. Catch too many good things. Let me come back here. Okay. So to all the saints in Jesus Christ. So this is important. What makes them a saint? What made a Jew a saint? Got Obedience. Question? Good question. Believing in Jesus as the Messiah? Well, what makes a Jew a saint? So before Jesus... The faithful obedience. Faithful obedience, yeah. Yeah, that, that's definitely going to be a part of it. But for the Jews, you have to go all the way back to Exodus and to Deuteronomy. 
And you're going to find this language a lot. In fact, in Exodus, when they first come to Sinai, one of the first things God says to them when he gets them there, he says, in um, Exodus 19, um, you are to be to me. Now that I brought you here, don't forget, I brought you out of Egypt. I did this for you. I saved you. But it wasn't just to bring you to the side and say, you're free. I saved you. See you, see you, catch you later after you die. He says, I saved you. And then I brought you to Mount Sinai. And then here he says, I'm going to make you a holy nation, mm -hmm. a royal priesthood. You are to be a holy people to me. And you'll find this all over Deuteronomy. He'll, he'll, he'll give instructions. He'll say, remember, you are a holy people to me. They are holy. They are hagia. This is the Greek word, hagia. They're holy. So this word that Paul uses is that language. It's that Jewish language of we're the holy people to the holy people of God. But before they were holy because they were in the presence of who? So Mount Sinai, whose presence made them holy? Yahweh. Yahweh's, right? And then now Paul changes and he says to all the saints in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. A lot, of, a lot of your Judaizers and your, your Jewish traditionalists would read this and they'd be like, no, you're holy in God. You're holy in God the Father. You're not holy in Christ Jesus. So Paul begins this letter by getting right to the point. And he immediately deifies Jesus by doing this. So these are just kind of cool little nuances that we typically read over and don't think nothing of. But when Paul writes this, He's a brilliant writer. He's like, I am going to passive aggressive and aggressive aggressive everybody in every word I do. He's right on it. So to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Who are bishops and deacons? Who's got different language in their Bible? I don't. Oh. The mine has overseers and deacons. Mm -hmm. Over That's what mine has. I like that one better. What's, what, what version is that? Um, it's the NIV. LEB. NIV. Is the, mine is the Lexian um, English. Where is it? At? Le Lexum English Bible. All right. Very nice. I like that. The NIV says the same thing. Overseers? Overseers. Overseers and and yes. Including elders. Mine says and elders. The has the same thing. Elders is a really good one as well. Yes. Okay. Here's here, here's what they mean, basically. And it's not a really huge thing, but it's just kind of fun to get. So the idea of bishop didn't come around until maybe another 100 years. I don't, I don't think it was that, that long later that truly the word bishop comes out the way we use it. Um, because a bishop is a, a, a position in the church, right? So for those who are Catholic or Episcopalian, you know what the bishop is, right? The bishop is above the priest. The bishop covers this whole area. The bishop's kind of like, in terms of a store, the bishop would be the district manager. I think that's a fair way to look at it, right? Okay, that would be the bishop. That's not exactly what this is. So it's not a really great word for it. The word basically means an overseer. So it is a person in charge. Mm -hmm. The word for deacon is, um, again, this is Paul going back to the servants of Jesus Christ. This is Paul using two opposites. The word for deacon means to serve, a server. And deacon is just, it's just a transliteration because the Greek word is diakonos. And so it's just a transliteration for this word that means servant. When Jesus was in the wilderness and you read that the angels ministered to him or the angels served him, the word that um, Mark uses there is the angels um, diakonosai. Uh, I probably got that wrong, but it was the same root word. So they served him. It's about serving. Marlene, you raised your hand. Hello. <laughs> um, and I thought that maybe when he mentions elders and deacons, he was actually differentiating because back in Acts, the first church did appoint deacons and elders um, as a separate group of people within the church. It's kind of like, well, yeah. pastoral group compared to laymen. Yeah. Absolutely. And so this is important for us also today. So we can learn examples from here because we do. Hey, we want to make our churches look as much as like the first church as we possibly could. Right. We all want to have that originality thing, which is which is good. But we can learn things from the first church, one of which Marlene just brought up that we saw in Acts that was 
intentionally done and that Paul mentions here as an expectation is that your church, your local church has organizational structure. It has governance. So a church from the beginning, in fact, they, they structured it in Acts on purpose. And you see Paul expecting this in the church he plans is your churches should have a governmental structure. They all did. They should have the servants. They should have overseers, you know, some kind of a structure to it. What's up, buddy? <laughs> and, um, and we even see almost at, a, at the district in general level, if you will, because when Paul and his people are struggling with him in, in, in Galatians, we see this. And in Acts, we see where they're arguing with him about being circumcised or not. Paul says, I'll tell you what. Let me take this to the main council in Jerusalem. So he takes it to the main council and they have their first kind of big giant council committee saying, well, I guess we can do this. And they have a big kind of head of all the church's committee group that says, here's what we've decided. We've decided as a group that we're going to allow people in the church not being circumcised. And you see the first amendment to doctrine, which is kind of crazy because that's a pretty big doctrine, wasn't it? I mean, yes. you don't just change that. We, we freak out at Pro as Protestants when people change the color of the carpet. Someone takes the pews out and puts the chairs in. Man, Sister, Sister Mary Lou's going to have a heart attack. But you try knocking out 4,000 years of everybody gets circumcised to you. We don't circumcise that. And I guarantee you a whole lot of Jewish people said, I'm out. We're not doing anything those hippies are doing. That's just ridiculous. <laughs> right? <It's crazy. laughs> but that's kind of the mentality it's at. So we do see structure and, and that's kind of what i want us to notice there that structure is an important part of church that we can even see in philippians so okay grace to you and peace from god our father and the lord jesus christ and i love this because grace and peace are important where if i were to tell your average christian child in sunday school where do we get our grace and peace from what are they going to tell me from jesus right so i went there because they're always right they know you don't know the answer. It's Jesus. <laughs> Jesus is always the answer, right, guys? Cindy knows. Okay. But we know that because we've already, after 2,000 years, had pounded in our head that Jesus is God. But we take for granted that this was not just accepted like it, like it is now. In fact, the whole concept of making Jesus God created all kinds of schisms and problems. And heresies. In fact, the first few hundred years of trying to decide who Jesus is was um, just a painful formation in the church. And it's also why we have um, things like the creeds, the, the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. It's why those are actually so important to all denominations. Yeah, so you, you've said before, right, that these letters were, you know, made to be read to people, right, in groups. And you don't know who's listening that may or may not be a believer, so when they hear this, it could really ruffle some feathers. Yeah. Yeah, I'm a, say for example, I'm a born and raised Jew, happy to be a Jew. And I thought, I heard about this Jesus and I think maybe he might be the Messiah. I'm gonna I'm go, I'm gonna go listen. And someone comes in and reads this letter, grace and peace to you from God our Father. That's perfectly Jewish. That's wonderfully Jewish. But from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And I might go, okay, I'm not sure how I feel about that. That's a pretty big, big, bold statement that I think we take for granted today. Because for us, we're like, well, yeah, it's Christianity. Jesus is the mainstay. That's what's named after, after Jesus Christ, the last name, right? We, we don't, we, we didn't have to go through the struggle, which is good, but it's also bad. I think when you go through the struggle of growing, you appreciate more of what you have, right? It's like like Mark's bus. I'm not gonna lie. Well, I, I've never been a VW guy. I'm not. And I've never even seen a VW truck. I didn't know they made one of those. And then Mark starts working on this thing in little pieces, putting it together. And Mark knows this thing. And even in a little bit that I've got to help him, today he let me drive it. He no longer has a third gear, <laughs> but he let me drive it. <laughs> 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 but having been through the pain of that, you appreciate it more, you know it more, and you think about it more, right? Any of you guys who've ever had to work on your own vehicle, 
know the difference in appreciating that vehicle than a vehicle you didn't have to. As Christians, we don't have to work on a lot of the things we just believe. And that wasn't the case for Paul. Okay. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We have a whole six minutes left, so I don't want to dig into the rest of this today. <laughs> so talk to me a little bit. What, what do we see here? We're going to move faster. I always take forever in the first three lines, I think, of everything we do. Because I want to set it up so we can go. So what, what do you expect to see? What are you seeing? What do you... Yeah, that's a great... That is the van right there. The bus man's van. Bus. It's a bus, right? Is it a bus or is it a truck? I don't know. Okay. Talk so, to me, folks. Give me your thoughts, your comments, questions. My thought. Yeah. Is uh, when I read that, bring up the scripture. Bring the scripture back up for me, please. Yeah. When I read uh, verse one, Okay, I, I thought it was actually two verses. So verse one, it, it makes me think about what Paul uh, said to Timothy, what he wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, which is, I mean, because this covers the whole basis. It covers Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to the saints in Jesus, in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi. He's talk, they're talking as both servants as believers and servants uh, and, and two servants and believers and Paul was teaching or writing Timothy or teaching Timothy to teach and urge the first Timothy uh, 6 3 to teach and urge these duties three whoever teaches otherwise and does not agree with the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ and the teachings that is in accordance with godliness is conceited and understands nothing and, I, and to me, that's, that's the defining difference between a believer and a, and, and a non-believer. It's those who actually believe in the sound words of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul, as a servant, he fully and wholly believed in the sound words of Jesus Christ. He would not yeah. teach something. He would not teach something that he did not believe in. Yeah, absolutely. And you're going to find Paul's language also, because he's right along those lines. He'll say something like, we believe, you know, that Christ was died and was risen as per the scriptures. Right. It right. goes back to those again. And, and we have to remember that when he talks about those, again, the words of Christ Jesus, he doesn't have the gospels yet. So Paul hasn't read Luke. He hasn't read Mark. He hasn't read Matthew. He hasn't read John. He, has, he, he probably hasn't seen those yet. And, and if, if any of them are out at all at this point, they, they barely come to Paul. Paul's been busy trying to stay alive and going to prison. But he knows. He's heard from Peter. He's heard from the apostles he's heard from others what's happening he's heard the stories of christ and to be fair even when he was persecuting god when he was persecuting christians being so diligent in his work i guarantee you paul had done his homework about what they thought they believed that way he <laughs> they were wrong right he's a study person and sometimes you want to destroy your enemy you'll study your enemy to death right and this is paul studied it to death and then he has this little encounter with jesus and Poor Paul, all that learning he did about Jesus kind of blew up in his face. He goes, wait a minute. This is real, right? And so, yeah, that's a great catch. And so the word of Christ and what he says and the gospel of Christ can be very important to you, what it is to be a believer. It's not enough to believe, okay, I believe in Jesus. Well, right. what Jesus, right? I got my, my uncle Jesus, right? He, he told me, like, why are you believing in me? Right? It's uh, a particular one for the scripture. So that's a good catch also, Doug. Anybody else? Two minute warning. I'm excited. Okay. Let me leave you with this thing. Read Philippians. I, I want to encourage you. I mean, you should have your regular Bible reading every day anyway. But I want you to add to it. I would encourage you to read it every day this week, actually. That when we come back next week, you've got a lot of it on your mind. It's, it's not a long read. Take you a whole 10 minutes to read the entire letter of Philippians. Bear in mind that it is a letter. And as such, it's written to a specific people. If you were to read a letter from a soldier in the Civil War, you would have to take that into consideration. If you're reading a letter from a soldier in the Civil War to 
is his fiance back home? You'd have to take that into consideration. If he were writing that to his, his parents, you'd take that into consideration. If it was a parent writing to the president, you take that into consideration. So take into consideration that he's writing to a church, a specific church. And also what Mark had said is when this went in there, the person who took the letter would go into the church with instruction, would read the letter to the group, would answer questions. They would basically be the facilitator of this. They would stand as the representative of whoever's letter they were reading. And then they would take the letter and usually they'd have a scribe make a copy. And then they loan that letter out to other churches to make copies. And that happened so much, that's actually where we get our manuscripts for the scriptures. There's people will say, I've heard people say, um, I believe in the perfect inerrancy of the Bible as per the original scriptures. Well, it's kind of interesting because there's no such thing as original scriptures. There's never <laughs> been a such thing as the original scriptures. Mm -hmm. There are the manuscripts that we have that have been put together to make the scriptures yeah. that we have. And so it would be shared also with other churches. Okay. So take it, read it, make notes, read it in different translations. You can, that even means different languages. So Martin, you want to bust out some Portuguese and some Spanish. You can read the French, even though you may not get it, but you probably make it work, I don't know. Can we read it in pigeon? You can read it in the pigeon. I'm not going to read it in class in the pigeon, but you can read it in the pigeon. And I'll be honest with you, while I don't use it for exegetical work, I love the message. Um, his work is, is truly, um, when you realize the full book, his work truly is very faithful to, to the scriptures. So I think the message is a very beautiful version as well. Pastor, I started reading Exodus in the message. Oh, yeah. And I'm really enjoying it. Eugene Peterson, had just he had this amazing heart for God really did it's um it's it's unbelievable so his his anything he ever wrote was just you can tell he's just in love with god and just wanted people to see what he saw and he was a very brilliant scholar but just an amazing human being so i'm a fan of it okay any questions comments final concerns before we um close on prayer here? um i actually read something uh regarding the book of Philippians that scholars it's kind of a conversation that scholars had that Philippians is actually several letters pieced together have you heard that or anything to that effect yeah so there's a lot of um uh, uh there's always debate about everything in the bible what it is what was redacted what was put together the thought in Philippians is because it doesn't actually follow flow very good um is that maybe it was three different letters that Paul had done and then they got squished together into one it's, it's not a huge thing. Um, uh, my personal and very limited uh, of view is that it is one letter. But again, as I study more, maybe I'll change my mind. I don't believe in any case, and even the ones who do believe that it's three letters put together, it doesn't change the theology or the message of it at all. So it's, it's kind, of a, kind of a moot thing. Because well, huh, the, the message is the same. Well, based on the little video that we watched tonight, it kind of makes it, you know, it, it surrounds a central theme, which would yeah. be chapter two. So on that aspect, I can see it being one letter because it connects to that, but they're disjointed in the sense, like how you say, Raul, it's not, it doesn't flow per se. Yeah. yeah, I think you're exactly right, Cindy. That's a perfect explanation. And, and, and I agree with the, the kind of the Bible project that it's one letter that flows around the Christ hymn. And then because it does that, it seems a little disjointed. Yeah, that's a great word, disjointed. I love that. Yeah, that's what Cindy said, Marlene. <laughs> I am the teacher, no. <laughs> there you go. She, can spelling, she can correct that. <laughs> Fourth grade only, though. <laughs> hey, that's tough these days. All right. Yes, Any other questions, is. comments? Yeah. Let me pray. Oh, Father, thank you for allowing us to gather, to begin to dig into your word. And I pray that you would guide us, that you would facilitate this conversation, that you would um, keep us on the path, help us to explore, but uh, um, keep us in a place, Father, where we are looking at you more than anything, always looking at you and always seeking to do this just so that we can love you more and know you more, Father. 
so we can obey you better, so we can serve you better. Transform us, make us into new people, Lord. Just guide us through, um, through this very act of worship. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.